the FinTech Faceoff. My name is Jennifer Grazel, and I lead global marketing for our services enterprise business here at LinkedIn. The future of finance is already here, but clarity remains elusive. The flare up and flame up of FinTech unicorns, the race of incumbents to innovate while challengers scale, the, um, the shadow of big tech behemoths, and the portent of Chinese platforms. In many debates, they discuss these topics. However, many events are too formulaic, and they don't get at the heart of the matter. Thus, we conceived an event with a difference, the FinTech Faceoff, a collaboration between Capgemini, LinkedIn, and 11FS. In this transatlantic tussle, we have teams both in America and Europe who are going to flex their FinTech muscle. They'll compete discussing the future of finance. And you viewers have a role too. So grab your seats, share your views, and crown the winner. Moderating live from New York is CBS News business analyst Jill Schlesinger. Over to you, Jill. Thanks so much. So my role here today is to be a really good traffic cop. And we have a Bobby over in London for the European side. Her name is Sarah Kachansky. So the two of us are going to moderate this live event. want to thank everybody at LinkedIn, Capgemini, and 11FS for helping to pull this off. An amazing effort. So the first job here is to actually introduce you to our team. Team Americas, co-captains, Shankar Krishnan, partner, Cap Gemini, Sam Mall, managing partner, 11FS. And our Team America debaters, starting with Bo Hartman, the CIO at Goldman Sachs Bank and the CTO of Marcus. Clara Shai, CEO, co-founder, Hearsay. Dan Egan, Director, Behavioral Finance and Investing at Betterment. Jane Barrett, CEO and co-founder, Goldbean, and author of Personal Finance and Investing Courses on LinkedIn Learning. Jeff McMillan is the Chief Analytics and Data Officer at Morgan Stanley. Catherine Petralia is the President and co-founder of Cabbage. And Zach Gibson is the Chief Innovation Officer at USAA. Now, we also have a robust social team, both here in the Americas as well as for Europe. If you want to join the conversation, use the hashtag WFTR18. Your social team, Captain By First, Jim Maru, co-publisher, The Financial Brand. Theodora Lau, Director of Marketing and Innovation at AARP. Sebastian Mounier, Director Chapuy Halder & Co. April Rudin, Founder and CEO, The Rudin Group. Bradley Lemer, Managing Director, Head of FinTech Strategy at Explorer Advisory and Capital. Anna Herrera, FinTech Correspondent at Reuters. Ron Shevlin, Director of Research, Cornerstone Advisors, Penny Crossman, Editor-at-Large, Source Media, and Dan Lattimore, Senior Vice President of Banking at Sellant. And now over to Sarah Kachansky, who will introduce the European team. Thank you so much, Jill. So I'd like to start by introducing our co-captains over here in Europe. First up, we have Alias Garnham, Head of Fintech at Capgemini. Second, we have Simon Taylor, who is a co-founder at 11FS. We also have an excellent debating team with us here today. We have Claire Calmeyane, who is Transformation, Transformation Director at Lloyds Banking. Jamie Campbell, Head of Awareness at Bud. Suresh Ramamurthy, who's the Chairman at CSW Bank. Nectarios Leolios, who's the CEO at Startup Bootcamp Fintech. Richard Davies, in charge of SME banking at TSB. And Simon Vanskalina, an engineer at Monzo. We also have an amazing social team over here in Europe. They're headed up by Spiros Magaris, who's a VC and advisor at Magaris Advisory. Andreas Straub, managing partner at Fair Advice and Partners AG. Simon Cocking, the editor-in-chief at CryptoCoin News. 
Gayla Boscovich, Head of FinTech and RegTech Partnerships at Startup Bootcamp. Sophia Cannon, Broadcaster and Sociopolitical Commentator. And Maria Deem, Vice Consul, Financial Services at the British Consulate General New York. And now we're going to go back to Jill, who's going to give us some more insight in how today is going to work, some housekeeping rules, and more details on the all-important voting element of today's event. Thank you so much. So we've all been to conferences, and I know you've sat in these and you've thought to yourself, is this the same stuff over and over again? Well, this is going to break the mold. We're going to cover some topics that have been in the conversation, but not in this format. We're hoping to break new ground with a lively, engaging, and illuminating debate. And I want to be sure that everybody understands that much of this debate was based on a fantastic report, which you can get, the Capgemini LinkedIn World FinTech Report for 2018. You should check that out. Using that, we've divided the event into two main sections. The first hour will be financial services, customer trust, and journey. The second hour, collaboration models between fintechs and traditional financial services firms. Now, each of these two main topics has, two, has five specific questions, so it's going to move along very quickly. In case someone goes too long, not that that would ever happen with any of the fabulous panelists on either side of the Atlantic, but just in case, we're going to have a timer. We're also going to have a buzzer if they go too long. It's kind of like a high-stakes chess match meets a frenetic game show. Our modified format for a debate will be as follows. For each question, both teams will start by laying out their opening positions. Each team will then have the opportunity to go first. The Americas will kick off the odd numbers. The European team will open the even numbers. At the conclusion of the opening positions from both teams, each team will then have a rebuttal period. Then one of the team captains will sum up the round, and you then have to do a little bit of work. It's time for you to vote. And the way that you vote is you go to Twitter, and you will follow the instructions at the bottom of your screen. There'll be specific hashtags to use. Sarah and I will each announce the results of the rounds at the end of the subsequent round. Are you ready? Because it is going to be a very bumpy ride. Let's go. Okay, here we go. The first section, customer trust and journey. And what we know now is that expectations for convenience and personalization are driving firms to quickly adjust to meet customer needs. The companies that deliver personalized, relevant, and seamless solutions will be among the winners. Our first question, what are the most overhyped and underwhelming emerging technologies in financial services today. Which technology actually has the most realistic chance of redefining the banking experience? We are going to turn to Catherine for the opening position for the Americas. Thank you. The Social Security Administration was founded in 1935 as a social insur insurance program to pay retired workers. In 1946, the administration added the words not to be used for identification to the card because even 80 years ago, they knew better than that. Absent any other way to identify consumers for everything from financial transactions to health care services to employment, the Social Security number quickly became the only way to confirm a consumer's identity. This scheme, as we all know, is seriously flawed. A quick Google search for KYC solutions yields page after pages of ads and results for all kinds of services claiming to solve any company's identity verification woes. By the way, if anyone from Pega Systems is listening, I think you're spending a little too much money on AdWords. <laughs> Take a quick walk through any FinTech conference and you'll see booth after booth of identity verification startups. Identity management solutions are the most overhyped and underwhelming emerging technologies today. How many of you are disappointed I didn't go with Bitcoin on this? <laughs> Old and new companies alike seek to fix our broken national system of identity verification. They can't do it, but it's not their fault. Increased regulation around identity management after 9-11 was very well intentioned, and the regulation continues to flow from FinCEN as we attempt to curtail money laundering and terrorism financing. We all want this, not just for AML KYC purposes, but for everything. Every day reveals yet another story of a hacked system, company, or election. Our national security depends on solving this problem, and some of our best and brightest technology minds have their hearts set on solving it. 
But until our governments adopt a national identity management strategy, one centered around something other than an easily guessed, purchased or stolen nine-digit ID, the problem simply can't be solved. Many countries around the world have tackled this issue with technology, including densely populated countries like Indonesia and India. Social security numbers were never intended to be used broad, to broadly verify identity, and it's clear that our continued use of them puts our identities and our democracies at risk. The only solution that will work is a willing coalition of public and private organizations that work together on this issue. Until then, every tech company that claims to have the identity management crisis solved is just biding their time until the next breach. Thank you. All right. Fantastic, Catherine. Thank you so much. And now we will have the opening position for the European team. Suresh, lay it out for us. Okay, so the overhyped technology is obvious. Uh, blockchain in its fifth or sixth year, um, it's like a hammer looking for a nail and it's found a whole bunch of nails that are holding some odd things together. So. I would look at, uh, from a banking perspective, uh, blockchain as is is extremely overhyped. It's unlikely to, it's, it's likely to come back in a different way, but as it is, it's, it's, it's meant for a decentralized banking system, not for a centralized uh, bank, a regulated banking system. Uh, in terms of uh, underwhelming technologies, um, I, you know, I start to lean more towards Catherine, uh, but more towards what I think uh, is a preventative compliance regime in banking, because end of the day, the biggest, um, what you call block in a bank, the, the, the thing that slows everything down is compliance. And in a digital world, if the number of transactions we're gonna do goes through an order of magnitude of one or two or three, even three zeros, uh, the what's slowing us down is going to completely gridlock banking and you cannot do whatever you need to do, whether it's simple payment. So um, it's, 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 it's how you do preventative compliance, how you, how you re-engineer banking is not talked about as much as the front-facing, consumer-facing or blockchain type, you know, the uh, hyped word. So I would say preventative compliance and one of the key things that you need for preventative compliance is a digital identity which Catherine talked about because a lot, I would say more than half of the problems comes from trying to build a profile against or trying to build a unique profile against a human being or an entity and you don't have a public good like uh, you have in India or in some other countries where a digital identity is a public good. Uh, whereas in, in the US it's, uh, uh, what is a reasonable <laughs> effort of a banker to find out what your identity is and which can be completely disagreed with by regulators. So you have absolute opacity on how you actually manage uh, identity verification uh, in one of the most developed countries. There are other countries that have figured this out, like Mexico, where you're going to soon have digital identity, I believe. Uh, but I think that is uh, very underwhelming, but it's, it's actually one of the inputs into compliance is digital identity. And that Today, to me, is very underwhelming, and I think that needs to be looked at. So, boss, back. All right. Well, now this is quite interesting because we have uh, two different views of this. Catherine lays out the identity management systems as underwhelming. Suresh, the blockchain, of course, we knew someone was going to bring that up. Uh, I also note with great laughter his idea around the compliance issues since I am married to a compliance professional and I was sort of hoping that would be like for the rest of my life, but maybe not. Uh, now we've got first up for the U.S. team, we're going to have our rebuttal from Jeff. Jeff, take it away. Thanks, Jill. So I would say... I would say the most overhyped uh, technology is AI, and the one that has most promise is AI. And I say that because we use this as such an amorphous blob of technology, and candidly, most people have no idea what they're actually talking about when we're talking about artificial intelligence. And there are aspects about artificial intelligence, anomaly detection, uh, identification of uh, opportunities next best action that are really powerful and can drive your business forward. Um, and then you sort of drift into this sort of sentient being space, and we are so far away uh, away from those things. We've done a lot of testing ourselves, and um, you know our jobs are safe for a while, particularly in the high-end world. And uh, and what we have found is that we have to stop making this conversation about who is smarter, myself or the machine, and start talking about how we make ourselves better at what we do using the technology 
uh, that's available. Lots of players in this space are sort of chasing after bots. And I met with a firm the other day who shall remain nameless, who basically said, listen, I can create a bot for you in 10 minutes if you give me a bunch of questions and answers. You can create a really bad bot in 10 minutes uh, with a lot of technology today. It takes months and even years to actually do it the right way. The second thing I'll say, the, the second pe most powerful thing you have in your organization is actually not a piece of technology. It's leadership and it's culture. And we spend so much time talking about the next new cool widget that's sort of coming down the line that's going to take us to the next century. And the reality is the reason you will fail has nothing to do with the fact that there is not a vendor solution in the marketplace that can solve your problem. The reason you will fail is because you could not align your business objectives and your organizational structure to embrace these new technologies in a way that actually grow your business and move the needle forward. Thanks, Joe. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, man. That was good. <laughs> I don't know this man that well, that. just so you know. <laughs> God, that was good. Okay. We are now going to go to the European rebuttal, and Claire will lay out that argument. I think it's, it's interesting we are talking um, since the beginning about technology when we define the customer experience. Uh, for me, it's really the customer that is defining this experience and we have not talked about it for the last you know, five minutes or six minutes. Um, customer are setting the bar. You know. This is why you know, FinTech sets the bar you know, in terms of offering new solutions. Um, this is what we aspire to offer the same type of experience. It's really about the customer. Um, then I will totally agree with some of the comments that were made around you know, the alignment, the execution of the technology, but I think the second part we didn't really discuss is you know, the underlying data, because for me, you know, digital, digital identity is just a way and a mean to access to banking services, and blockchain is just a container that will store very securely distributed data. Um, and to some extent, you know, a chatbot is just our AI, is just a manipulation of this data. Really, data is the underlying, not technology, but the underlying asset that is, will, will make change uh, and redefine the banking experience in the future. The ability of organization to have highly personalized experience um, that they deliver to the customer is the trend we are seeing clearly in the industry. Um, so for me, you know, it's not about digital identity, it's not about blockchain, it's not about AI, it's not about chatbot, it's about customer and data. Okay, so at the end of each round, we've got a team captain who will kind of provide a nice tidy summation for you. Sam, give us a summation of round one. So actually, first I got to say this because my wife keeps texting me. I know my socks don't match, all right? And it's Eli's fault. He did the laundry. I swear to God, the kid has no attention span and it's driving me crazy. You all <laughs> will see that in a minute. What's the most overhyped technology? Freaking everything. Seriously, if there's an industry that can overhype, we're it, right? We push we, AI like crazy, blockchain like crazy. We talk about big data. We overhype everything. What about the most underwhelming? Everything. OK, um, honestly, thank you, Elon Musk, for launching a car into space. That was pretty cool. I like that. But I, I like what Bill Gates says. He's smarter than me. He, yeah, I think everybody knows this quote. We always, over, always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. Don't let yourself be lulled into inaction. Ooh, I got that in. Proud of it. OK, now it is your turn to do something yourselves as you watch this wonderful debate. Go on to Twitter and start your voting process. You will see there are two different hashtags, one for the Americas, one for the European team, and you will now be able to vote. We will announce the winner of this first round in our next round. And for that next round, I am going to Sarah, who will start in with round two. Thank you so much, Jill. What an exciting start. We've already hit blockchain, AI, and compliance, and we're only 20 minutes in. So we're going to continue that trend and move on to a subject dear to many of those in the fintech industry's hearts, data, and specifically how firms can extract maximum value from it. So our second question is, how are companies leveraging data to understand customer needs, improve trust, 
and drive engagement and loyalty. A reminder that our panelists can use examples from other industries if they like on this one. And we're gonna go straight over to Jamie, who's gonna give us the opening position for the EU. Well, before we get started talking about data uh, in the EU, we really have to mention GDPR. We mentioned earlier around uh, how, how customers and companies are helping uh, you know, customers uh, trust the companies that they use. And GDPR is one of those initiatives which has been led by the EU, EU and pioneered across the world you know, as a real standpoint about putting trust and power back in the customer's hands. So I think that's one that we definitely need to get out of the way uh, uh, first. In terms of how companies are, are helping com uh, cust uh, customers achieve more with their data, really when we're talking about financial services, we're talking about unlocking hidden meaning in transactional data. Uh, companies such as Bud, uh, we're helping uh, small businesses uh, go through the, go through the uh, onboarding processes of applying for small business loans. Uh, we're partnering with a company like iWalker uh, to pre-fill forms and make sure that companies can go through those processes as quickly as possible. Because let's face it, if you're a small business, you don't want to spend all your time filling out forms. Um, equally, on the consumer side, going deeper into how your, how your uh, spending is, uh, what it's saying about your life. So really joining the dots between your spending and what that means for you. So if you're spending money and, uh, on, on an airport or a, in, a, in, a, in a traveling capacity, um, you know, really providing the information back to customers on, uh, on, on uh, exchange rates, um, really being proactive with how data is being used and connecting people to those, uh, uh, to those high pieces of, of information. <laughs> All those notes that you write, you know, they really, they really go out of your head instantly. Thank you so much, gents. <laughs> right. Thank you very much. And now we're going to go back to Clara, who's going to give us the US's opening position. So everyone's talking about data, um, but it's really not about data. It's about insights and what you do with the data and insights. Um, it's interesting to talk about how data can be used to drive engagement and trust when you need to have engagement and trust in the first place to be able to get the data from consumers in the first place. Um, so let's talk about digital direct and digital advised. Digital direct highly transactional. Um, we know it's a race to the bottom. There's a lot of data, so the volume of data is there. Um, but the quality of data, some of the most rich interactions happen with advisors. Um, and this is true both for commercial clients as well as high net worth um, individuals, that firms' most valuable clients generally have some sort of advisor because those clients demand concierge services. And with digital, with data, with automation, we can help scale those concierge services down the chain, which is why we see everyone from established firms to Schwab and Vanguard to even fintech firms like Betterment now actually having human advisors in that hybrid model. So we know the big unlock is really the advisors. What's happening right now is a black box, frankly. And so how are firms solving this? Almost every firm that we talk to at Hearsay, they are even either considering or have already deployed some sort of CRM system. Multi-millions of dollars to, to deploy, um, many years um, to, to get settled. So they put it out there, and then what happens? Nothing because advisors, like any of us, don't like to do manual data entry. So they stand up these fancy CRM systems, and advisors don't, after they have a great meeting with a prospect or client, the first thing that they do isn't to run back to their computer and enter all of their notes into CRM. It's just not realistic. And so these CRM systems stand pretty empty, and there ends up being this huge divide between what's happening at corporate and what's happening with Digital Direct, all of this data, high volume, disconnected with what's happening in the field. That therein lies our biggest opportunity. Both in Europe as well as in the US, compliance can actually be our friend when it comes to data. The books and records requirement um, where we have to capture and supervise everything that happens from calls to text messages to social media to email, that is actually, um, it is a burden to capture, but it's actually an advantage when you're thinking about collecting data in structured ways. Thank you. That's it. 
Thank you so much, Clara. So um, really interesting opening positions there. We managed to hit GDPR. That's four out of four. Um, we were talking about compliance more broadly. Again, you know, how it can help with these, uh, with these data questions and indeed the democratization of services. So a reminder to our audience that if you like what you heard, you can head over to Twitter to vote on who you think had the best position there. And whilst you're doing that, we're going to go over to Suresh, who's going to deliver the rebuttal for the European team. So data. Banking has bad data. It doesn't have good data. That's at least my learning so far. Because um, end of the day, banking is in the business of commerce enabling consumers and businesses, which means they're doing something else to do a com commercial transaction. And our role in banking is to enable that or to even understand what they need at the right time and provide the ability to do a value transfer or provide a loan or liquidity meet a liquidity gap. So what we found is, uh, as banking is evolving, the data from the past, historical data is very bad because may, there was memory constraint, bad machine, you know, smaller machines, and you don't have the contextual data that you need to do what uh, this send is AI. We can't even get to AI. We have to get to machine learning. To get to machine learning, we don't even have good data to learn in a very organized, structured way. So what you hear about AI is people connect, you know, collecting forms and things. And you know, the front end, you can do some, uh, some amount of uh, social media engagement and mobile app engagement. So what we have found is you, you're going to have an order of magnitude of data per transaction that you didn't have five, six years ago. So that's going to allow you to do some things incrementally but not in a dramatically improved fashion. It's going to drive some amount of engagement. Uh, we're going to see some changes in bill pay. Maybe it's going to anticipate your amount of bill you're going to pay and maybe even offer a loan. It's going to uh, do the same thing in terms of wealth management, but it's not going to be uh, what you see in the, some of the ads or thing where some uh, computer voice talks to you and tells you, you know, you should be buying this stock, selling that stock. That's not going to happen. It's still going to be human led, uh, human being led. So. From my perspective, yes, there is going to be a data-assisted engagement models throughout uh, banking. Uh, and there are certain areas where banking can collect really good data to really good machine learning. Uh, that would lead to more, uh, let's say, faster uh, tools for helping customers to make decisions faster through endpoint devices, which could be a, a Google Home, Alexa, or could even be a, you know, a smartphone. So I will leave it at that. So. Thanks, Suresh. Okay, so it's over to Dan for the US's rebuttal. Uh, that's a, a very sunny outlook, Suresh. Wow. Um, so it's not going to get better and it's too hard. Um, so I think one thing that we touched on that is very important is that you need high quality data. And the way that you do that is you invest in systems to generate high quality data. One of the things that we do a lot of is many iterative small experiments. So you don't need big data. You need the right size data to answer the questions so that you can change the product that the customer sees, how they experience it. We've been able to do this in a number of ways to help clients make better decisions like maybe they shouldn't sell that stock or maybe they shouldn't change their allocation. Um, that involves also owning enough of the data through the entire pipeline so that you're not relying on third parties who can't do what you need them to do. Uh, Betterment has a feature called Tax Impact Preview that before a client goes through with a transaction, we are actually able to estimate the tax impact and tell them whether or not we think it's a good idea for them to go through with that based on the taxes they're going to incur. So I think that the customer experience and how your systems, the, the infrastructure that you invest in, so that the product changes, the service changes over time because of the personal experience that each client has is incredibly important. And the <coughs> investment that you need to do, this is the big difference. It's not a matter of generating data. It's a matter of taking that data and iteratively changing the product that the customer experiences. Um, I'm going to end on one sort of strange question. Is the UK still part of the EU? <laughs> oh, Ooh, wow. Nice one. There is some smack down there, Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> Too early? <laughs> well, well the, the correct uh, the, um, the answer is that yes, it is for now. Um, we're going to turn it over to uh, Elias, who's going to give us a quick summary on his thoughts from that first round. Go for it. So, technically, yes. UK is part of the EU as we speak. So I think, what are the messages first? GDPR is big time changing the way we engage. Uh, uh, concierge, having the right data available. Having more smart data, 
be able to get the right information. I love the example of saying, well, salespeople don't run to the CRM, so we need to help them get there. But for me also, the most important part, what my colleague was trying to say also is PST2. In Europe, what we are doing here is also now enabling everybody to have access to the data. And by having access to the data, now we can get smarter decisions. I think the example that Suresh gave about Alexa, now I will be able to engage with Alexa, not only for basic stuff, but maybe for more complex stuff. Based on my behavior, based on my spending, based on my family, Alexa could get me different pieces of information. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone, in fact. And now we're going to go back to Jill, who's going to let us know which team won round one and summarize how you can vote on the round you've just seen. Over to you, Jill. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah. Okay, round one, the winner is America's. Oh, where's Simon at? <laughs> okay, uh, now remember, if you would like to vote in this round that we've just completed, round two is really quite vibrant, I must say. Just go to Twitter and follow the hashtags down at the bottom of your screen. You could vote for either the Americas or for the European teams. And don't forget to weigh in and comment. Hashtag WFTR18. And now it is on to round three. OK, so we know that driving insights through data is key for this personalized experience we just talked about. Big data, small data, incremental data, whichever way you want to do it. But here's the question. All the companies have the data. They have technology. How are they going to get there? Here is your question number three. How can banks meet rising expectations while saddled with legacy systems? Are APIs and open banking the final answer or simply a stopgap solution? For the Americas, the opening position will be delivered by Bo. So first off, I want to say, uh, Simon, haven't seen you in a while. That's a beautiful jumper. Thank you for wearing it, my friend. Um, so the, uh, the question has a lot to unpack. The first part about it is, uh, can you know, these legacy companies overcome the debts that they have? And we talked about technical debt, which we'll get to. But what's more important, there are three major debts inside of these legacy firms that they have to overcome. First one is product or process debt. Second one is organizational debt. And third one's technical debt, which we'll tag at the very end of this. The first part is there's a lot of products and processes that the firms really have a hard time going after. It's difficult to retire a product. It's very hard to change a process inside of an ingrained organization. The second one is organizational debt. Organiz organizational debt is challenging. That's a cultural move. You have to move hearts and minds. And when you have large organizations, they create something that I like to refer to as the immune system. And the immune system is there to protect it for, for compliance reasons, regulatory reasons, or just the fact that we've always done it that way. And to tackle that one, companies put a lot of effort into it, but it's very hard to move the massive needle. Without moving those two pieces, actually moving the third debt is very challenging, technical debt. But we like to focus on it because of all the overhyped things that my colleagues talked about earlier. And it's also the, the big ticket item in the budgets. CEOs and CFOs look at that line item, and then they say, hey, what if I cut a third of that out? Look at all the things I would save through automation. But if you don't tackle those first two, Automation can only make it so far. Before I get to the API and open banking question, because everyone likes to jump to the solution, I'm going to talk about how we tackled it in Marcus, uh, Marcus by Goldman Sachs. Those three debts that I talked about actually were very, very impactful to my thinking before I joined Marcus by Goldman Sachs. I lived my career in major companies that were partially good at tackling those things or failed completely at tackling those things. And the, the ideas that I generated in those times of running those platforms is that, yes, I can put a new automation system in, or yes, I could always put a CRM system in. But at the end of the day, if I don't move those things, then I'm just really pretty much putting a veneer over other areas. Technology in these large organizations are gangly and cysts that stretch out everywhere. The last part that I'd like this to say on the APIs and open banking really quickly is there are good frameworks and they're just frameworks. There's something that's going to come out after that. And we as technologists just have to be one step ahead in making sure that we're doing it. <clears throat> OK, thank you. And now, over the pond, to the opening position for Europe. Suresh, you're up. 
So I, know, I kind of agree with him, but I have a different take on this, having gone through a transformation. Uh, there are four things I which I've learned uh, in the last five years on this. One is um, it, banking as it is, or legacy banks are transactional systems. So you have like some, in some, even in a small bank, when we bought one, we had like 20 plus transactional systems. And I'm assuming a large bank has thousands of uh, unique transactional systems. So, uh, banking is a process business. Running on a siloed transaction system and organizational structure is kind of built around these transaction systems. You have a head of cards, head of debit, head of this, head of that. Whereas really, a card is a token for accessing money from a number in a database. So we had to rethink banking as a process. And if you really do that, it banking comes down to less than 50 processes end to end, uh, with including embedding compliance in it, right? So that is the first thing you have to do is to do an organizational transformation. You got to figure out what your processes look like without which you don't know which way to redo the org, right? Uh, the next thing we looked at was there is a lot of cost centers that are built around and uh, what you call third-party vendor transaction systems that really prevent you from offering solutions that, uh, that, that really would meet the consumer needs, but the cost structure of multiple transaction systems don't enable you to do that. Uh, it could be bill pay, it could be card issuance. So we redid all of that. So we moved a lot of cost centers to profit centers. And one of the things that we, uh, the issues in banking is settlement and reconciliation is not talked about much, but it's the single biggest headache in banking because you could spend $1,000 chasing a dollar in you know, discrepancy. So we had to figure out how to do real-time settlement and reconciliation across all kinds of products. So you got to redefine how you do these, these uh, flows in banking. So once you get to that, then you get to the third thing, nothing moves in banking without real-time compliance. So the existing legacy compliance regime is post-transaction random sampling of a few transactions to test other than watch list testing. That doesn't scale well because you you have, uh, I'm sure all the big banks are building full of uh, false positive watchers, people whose only job is to look at false positives and you know remove them or to put them into a case management. So we went to a real time data analytics of every transaction that allows you to actually scale up with lower costs. If you do all this, you get to a different place. You get to where the bank is uh, poorly addressable today uh, to a tokenized bank account, becomes a smart account. So the bank account itself is going to evolve from a simple static ledger-based account to a tokenized All right. Well, so this is kind of fascinating because it looks like we're addressing the problem from two very specific standpoints. Um, I think that when you think about those three different debts, the four different ways to rethink your banking, you've got a lot to contend with. If you think one of these two guys made a better argument, head on over to Twitter where you can vote. You just look at the hashtags on your screen and you can start voting now. Or you may want to wait till after the rebuttal period. So now let's go to our beautiful rebuttalist, <laughs> Zach for the Americas. You're lovely. I've been called many things, uh, but beautiful is not <laughs> one of them. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have been called a father, and so uh, first and foremost, I'm a dad, but I'm a child of the 80s. And so I'm a child of the 80s, and I'm a parent of 2018. And so imagine a conversation I would have with my daughter, who's six, and if I looked at her and said, honey, I'm sorry I can't parent you, because I'm a child of the 80s. I don't, I don't know how to be a parent, because it's 2018. But I love her, and so what I've had to do is I've had to reboot my own internal operating system to be a parent of 2018, not a child of the 80s who's trying to be a parent of 1980. And so how are banks any different? Well, I love my daughter, but if you ask your bank, does your bank love you? Does your bank care for you? Does your bank want to see you achieve your goals? The answer in many cases is no. But the answer should be yes. And if the answer is yes, then the bank needs to figure out how. And having an excuse that legacy systems and operations and processes can't enable the bank to serve you is not acceptable. The answer has to be start somewhere. Start somewhere. Make it easy for your customers to do business with you. Make sure that their data is safe and secure. Help them pay down debt. Help them send their child to college. Those are things you could do today before you touch your core operating systems. So I would encourage you bankers and you Europeans Think like a parent, <laughs> love your kids, love your customers. 
<laughs> Thank you. That's great. Nice um, and we're printing up T-shirts. Does your bank heart you any moment now? <laughs> uh, okay, we are going to go over to Europe. Delivering the rebuttal for the European team is Simon. Should I wait for the buzzer? No, I'll just start. Uh, my bank loves you, genuinely. <laughs> we, we love our customers. <clears throat> Uh, I'm Simon, I'm an engineer, I work at Monzo. We built a bank from scratch in three years, so I feel a bit um, disingenuous talking about legacy because we haven't got any. Um, but I have worked for big banks before. I've worked for banks where you'd work for 12 months to get one tiny little change um, that didn't even really affect the customers. Um, when you say legacy, I like to like divide the world into, like not just like legacy means there's stuff that you don't really understand that's old. I like, I like to define the, define the world by like before Google and after Google. See, a few years ago, Google basically took the technology that powers their data centers. They took microservices and Kubernetes and a, and a, and a programming language called Golang, and they basically open sourced all that, and they put all that out in the world. And if you look around the top tech companies now, pretty much like all of the big ones are using the same tech stack. They're using microservices, they're using container management systems like Kubernetes, and they're using um, languages like Golang um, to basically build um, software that where you can release things at the speed of thought. You know, you can write some code. Like I literally released a feature to our staging environment while I was waiting for this thing to start. Um, that's like that is the pro that is like it's not good enough anymore to say like oh we're managing down our legacy we're managing down our technical debt no if you if you're a company that has been born after this sort of like step change in the way IT is done then you're never going to catch up um, when we were building Monzo from scratch we started three years ago we talked to a lot of people about like what even is a core banking system and no one could really tell us like is it a a series of credits and debits that sum to zero, or does it include the card processing, or do you have to have an end of day batch? Like, what are, what are we even talking about? And in the end, we decided that we would just have one system, like one giant system. It doesn't have an API, it is an API. It uses HTTP all the way from the customers all the way through to our core backend systems. It's just one giant API. So there's no legacy systems to manage. Um, so I don't really know what the answer is. Are, like, are APIs the final solution or a stopgap? I don't know. Um, I think that they, you know, APIs are going to change banking. They're going to change the world forever. They're going to make customers' data available to customers in a way that they, they want to use that data. Um, whether or not we move to a post-API world where we use smart contracts, like that might be the future. But for now, APIs are, are such a big thing. Like, don't try to look past them. Just embrace them. Um, you know, and build a new bank, build a new core banking system. It's not that hard. We built the whole bank in three years. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Pretty tough, man. OK, Shankar, you've got your work cut out for you. Give us a quick summary of this third round. Absolutely. Uh, glad to do that. Great uh, conversation around the room today. I think sometimes banks, like smoking kills, need to have something which says legacy kills. Because legacy comes in the way of smart ideas. Legacy comes in the way of good ideas. There is oftentimes a lot of business rules that the business folks are want to take to the market, but legacy stifles. So the good news for us is that, I mean, Suresh is a good example of having created an API that works for payments. We see MuleSoft, Apigee, and folks like that build billion dollar businesses backs on API. So I think API is a good short term solution. What I see happening is that there's going to be a lot of APIs, public, private, and third party, that API management is going to be the next science. So legacy is a problem. API helps us for now. Long ways to go. Banks need to change, move into new systems, and be the APIs themselves, like Simon was saying. That would be my. Thank you very much. OK, so we now have uh, our winner for round two, going two for two. It is America's once again for round two. Don't get so high on your horse. Come on, there's a long way to go here. Uh, remember that you can vote by going on to Twitter. Just look at those hashtags at the bottom of your screen, and you will be able to vote live at any time. Uh, and it's time to move on to our fourth question. And for that, we go over to Sarah, who will take over now. Thank you, Jill. Well, that was exciting and indeed emotional, I would say. Um, come on, guys, we've got some work cut out for us here. Let's see if we can, uh, we can win the next round here, which is on a subject matter that has sparked debate across the financial services sector and indeed far beyond. We're talking blockchain. 
Is it the cure to all firms' inefficiency woes, or is it an overhyped technology that's never going to take off? We're going to start off with Simon, who's going to give us his opening position on the question, which is what does blockchain hold for future and financial services? Thanks a lot, Sarah. Oh man, like getting up here and defending blockchain uh, in front of a bunch of cynical people is a it's a it's a tough gig, but I'm going to give it a go. Um, so the killer use case for blockchain exists. It's cryptocurrency. There's like hundreds of billions of dollars of value locked up in in the public blockchains. Um, the two biggest being the Ethereum and Bitcoin blockchains. Um, but the use case that um, really excites me more than the sort of self issuing cryptocurrencies is the idea that commercial banks and central banks could actually issue uh, cryptocurrencies. I'm not suggesting the Bank of England does an ICO, by the way, um, before, before we <laughs> get down there. But um, three years ago, we started Monzo. And two years ago, uh, I worked on the project to get us connected to the faster payment scheme. And the way that actually worked was we had to you know, actually physically plug fiber optic cables, you know, the other end of which was at the clearing system, into uh, our data center, which was really hard because we were in the cloud, but we managed it. And then we had to write esoteric software to speak, like really, really uh, old school protocols to actually talk to the, the central infrastructure. And I, I kept thinking the whole time, like, this would be so much easier if there was just the trust in cryptography, if there was just a smart contract out there where we could take you know, the amount of value we're attempting to send from one bank to another, like as a centrally bank issued cryptocurrency and send it to a smart contract with instructions as to who the final recipient was, right? It would have saved us like a year of, of hard work. So as an engineer, like for me, the technology, um, it seems novel and it seems very, very powerful. Um, and I'm not really, uh, I don't really think it's, um, I think once you've actually played around with it, it's, it, it, it is credible. It's not just pure hype. Um, Blockchain's been around for 10 years now, and a lot of engineers think it's, um, it's, 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 uh, it's good technology. It just, it's going to require um, like multiple parties to be on both sides of every trade, right? Um, so the, like, to get access to, like, when you get access to faster payments in the UK, that's just a clearing system. Basically, you're just sending messages about you know, who's going to receive the money and who's sending the money. But the actual settlement system, um, that actually happens at the central bank. So that happens at the Bank of England. And the old lady of Threadneedle Street doesn't work on the weekends, right? Like, so you, you basically, you only settle three or four times a day. And that puts counterparty risk out there as well. Um, if the central banks were actually you know, brave enough to embrace blockchain and issue their commercial banks with sort of tokenized national currency, issue them with actual uh, currency. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simon. So now it's over to Jane for the US's opening position. Simon. <laughs> Thanks, Simon, for that uh, very well-rounded argument. I think uh, Anyone who's been in the fintech space a while, or frankly, any technology space, you know to beware the profits. And you know who I'm talking about, right? Every conference you go to, they have the solution for how everything is going to change. I've been in technology since the 90s, and every year is the year of something. Hmm. It's year of search, it's year of social, it's year of mobile, it's year of e-commerce, and everything is going to change. But technology is additive. And one of the big issues with blockchain is a, there was a lot of profits and a lot of money without really a whole lot of use cases coming quickly thereafter. And B, some of the, these profits were talking a lot of theory, right? Show me, show me the money, show me where it actually goes. So in wealth specifically, I am an investment advisor in the wealth sector, there really hasn't been a killer application beyond crypto. Like we have a database innovation and that's what blockchain is. There's been a couple of exceptions in terms of innovation and wealth. I think T0 have done something really interesting in terms of um, the back end of trading. Um, blockchain exchange, which is launching next month, should be a very interesting innovation. But beyond that, I think we can all admit that the innovation's been pretty limp. So I'm going to issue a challenge to the profits, who may or may not come after me. If you were to decouple crypto from blockchain, all we have is a database innovation. Challenge one. Challenge two, what is the blockchain application that the humans of the world can get? 
Like seriously, distributed ledger, can we have some better words, please, that like some actual human beings can say, this will make an impact on my life. It's solving a problem that is not currently being solved, however badly, it show me some exponential impact of, block of blockchain application that can actually make a genuine impact on my life. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>
but uh, in the words of Matt Levine, who is a financial columnist at Bloomberg. Um, I have a half-baked, three-quarters joking theory of cryptocurrency, which is that it is a magical incarnation of a sort of internet male grievance. People, mostly men, sit around on Reddit complaining that they are underappreciated geniuses and that it is unfair that they have not been rewarded with wealth. They expect that the modern world should reward computer literacy, and then they grow up to realize that the modern world, much like the old world, rewards mostly people who have creativity and emotional intelligence. And then Bitcoin came along. And the paranoid computer literate people who spent a lot of time on the internet were the early adopters and became the world's first economic system that allocates wealth basically for hanging around on Reddit. <laughs> Mic drop. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dan. Um, so over here we have Simon Taylor who's going to give us what he thinks are the salient points on that <laughs> subject matter. I am not going to give you any salient points whatsoever. I am going to rant back at Dan. Um, and, and I think primarily the term vapid was what stuck out to me right then. Um, if you've heard of modern slavery, it's one of the most unfortunate things in humanity at the moment. People are manufacturing goods and services and not being paid for it. What the, the problem with modern slavery is it's very hard to prove what's happening and where goods came from. Large retailers don't know where their goods come from, even though throughout the process there is a certification and there is a completely well-known set of paper trails that happen throughout that. And even though each of those people has a mobile device, there is absolutely no single database that has all of world trade. Because what country do you put that in? Where do you centralize it? What old technology do you centralize around? So for a vapid use case, how about preventing modern slavery? How about preventing all kinds of horrors like that that we see around the world? I think new technology can do amazing things, and I think blockchain is just getting started. Thank you very much all. That was possibly one of the most passionate debates I've ever heard about blockchain. Um, I'm now going to throw it back to Jan, who's, Jan, I'm not, I apologize. I'm going to throw it back to Jill, who is giving, to give us the results for the voting on the previous round. Well, round three, the winner is Europe. So now we have rounds one and two going to the Americas, round three going to Europe. If you would like to vote, Head over to Twitter. Use the hashtags at the bottom of your screen. Weigh in on this. It's very fun. Um, and now I guess that we've sort of gotten a lot of stretching done. We've gotten our, our juices flowing. And that means it's time for the last question of this first section. And it is SmackDown time. If you didn't think the blockchain was going to do it, here we go. Here is question five. Americas or Europe, which has been more successful in building trust and delivering customer experience? The opening position for the U.S., Bo, you are up. Yeah. Um, so I was, I was very lucky. I spent four and a half years at Barclay Card, based out of London, England, and I was uh, deeply immersed inside of the uh, U.K. and European uh, banking system. Years before that, I was with Capital One. I helped launch a business in France and helped shut that business down as well. So I had the experience of not doing digital banking very, very well. And then most of my career has been inside the United States in the banking organizations. I'll have to tell you the best banking uh, systems that I could see in the, United, uh, in the world right now are in Europe. And I know that so some of my colleagues in the United States might feel a little taken back about that. But the Europeans, specifically in the UK, have definitely taken the lead in that domain about opening up PSD uh, 1 and 2, most definitely opened up the doors for faster payments. The open banking standards have been driven out of there. The fintech revolution, I argue, started in Europe. But before the Europeans get too excited about that, <laughs> I would tell you that um, the one thing about the US that you can always tell is that we're a sleeping giant. And when we wake up, we're more than happy to borrow all the great ideas from around the globe to actually kick off and create innovation in and of itself. We're actually seeing that with, when I came to Marcus uh, by Goldman Sachs, like I said earlier, a lot of the things that impacted my past career created the things that we're building today. So at Marcus, we started with building the, uh, from our consumers in the middle and building out. We had 10,000 interviews. And in those interviews, we used the overlay of what are the things that you find most important to you, being transparent, being clear, putting automation that was simple and easy, instead of using tens or 20 versions of your data, taking five simple elements and making a very quick decision. And all of those are actually leading to a better place of customer experience and engagement. Also, with our partnerships with the fintechs, we're very happy to engage with fintechs and make them part of our ecosystem to improve the experience overall. 
And so in, from my standpoint, why I believe the UK and the Europeans definitely have us uh, out of the gate, I think over the long term, I think the Americans will actually come in and we'll actually be implementing the next version of innovation for the consumer and for the banking systems overall. Well said. Okay, for the opening position in Europe, let's go to Simon, who will take over from here. Four words, treat the customer fairly. That's it, it's that simple. Uh, the UK regulators, um, when we were thinking about starting Monzo, were really super clear. Like all regulation basically boils down to don't break the law, but treat the customers fairly. And this has like been the ethos of, I think, of the financial services market in the, in the UK for the last few years now, ever since probably 2009. Um, and then you can see that coming through everything, like through GDPR, through PSD2, through giving customers access to their data. Um, it's all about treating the customer fairly. Um, but beyond that, I think there's something else. Like if you want to build trust with your customer, you have to never betray them. You have to never reorder their purchases so that you make the most amount of, over, of, of overdrafts. Or you, you have to not send them letters saying that you're going to you know, um, charge them for an unauthorized overdraft fee after you've already charged them the unauthorized overdraft fee. You have to not charge them $30 for a one pound being overdrawn. You have to Basically, it, it's so counter to the way banks have been run for so long, the way banks here um, used to be run. So I think, um, I think, like at Monzo, we basically decided to be really, really transparent about everything from the early days. And um, the, the feedback from the customers has been incredible. Like people just love us. Um, they are obsessed with Monzo, with the color of the cards, with the like the you know. It's like apparently it's a dating line now. It's like if you've got Monzo, um, and like all that comes back to basically treating the customers fairly and being transparent. And um, so yeah, that's it basically. Treat the customer fairly. <laughs> okay, four words. Treat that customer fairly. Be transparent. Um, and will that U.S. sleeping giant catch up? You may want to vote on that right now. If you do, head over to Twitter, hashtags at the bottom. And feel free to weigh in on this argument, hashtag WFTR18. Now, for our rebuttal here in the U.S., Miss Clara, tell us what we need to know. Two words. Two words, free market. The customer will go where they're treated fairly. Venmo, PayPal, where did all these companies start? Um, the US will win in the long term because FinTech um, is driven by tech. And tech is, uh, we lead tech in, in the US. And the fact that we have this scale means that, as you heard from my partner, Bo, earlier, that all of the best ideas that we see in Europe, in Asia, Latin America, all around the world, we will fold into um, the behemoth that is, that is Silicon Valley and tech um, and everything America. That's it. Brilliant. Drop the milk. That was good. Okay. Uh, okay, let's see. We've got a uh, European rebuttal. I believe that that would be Simon who's up. Different Simon this time. Um, and I get two and a half minutes to speak. Yay, Sam, shout out about your socks. They're amazing, and I'm sure they were ethically sourced. So I'm sure they came from some sort of blockchain. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, so the interesting thing about a free market and a big market is it's a big country with very different cultures. Um, Americas are a very big place, but especially uh, North America, you have the West Coast and the East Coast. You have policy on one side and tech on the other side, and you have a, uh, what? five levels of um, federal regulation, each state needs to get regulated. Getting anything done costs a lot of money and is extremely hard. Now, there are good initiatives like Lab CFTC and similar initiatives from the OCC that are coming out that will mean the US will improve. But I think if Europe has an advantage, and especially the UK, it's policy. The ability to have three of the world's top 10 universities within an hour's drive of London. You've got all of the policy making decisions right there in London, and you've got the tech center of Europe right there in London, and you've got Berlin just down the road, and many other great tech centers in the Nordics. We have a burgeoning 
ability to grow a new set of businesses. And I think the question was always, will Europe develop the unicorns? Will it develop the decacorns? Will it develop the really big companies? And it was definitely behind the US, where you had capital that had been investing for some time in pure tech plays. So we saw Stripe, and we saw Square, and we've seen those companies do well in a very large home market. But now we're seeing the companies in the UK that have been around for a few years, especially the challenger banks, not neobanks, not an app on top of somebody else's banking license, but an entirely new bank start to reach scale. Starling, Monzo, Atom, Oak North. These organizations are starting to really grow. And this is what excites me about Europe is really a lot of the policy around general data protection regulation that Jamie mentioned, around PSD2 and open banking, is about creating a market in which fintechs can play and can succeed for consumers. And it's about not doing that in too a draconian way. It's about treating customers fairly. And I think principles based regulation is actually a lot easier to deal with. It, it's, um, it's nice to call the USA a free market, but the reality is when you've got 50 different state regulators, it's very expensive market. All right, that's me. <laughs> well said. Okay, uh, we're going to have a summation of this final round in our first section. And just remember, right after this, we will have a break. So just remember that. Okay, Sam, would you like to summarize this wonderful SmackDown? I think we all just came across as pompous asses. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't talk about China. That's true. <laughs> we didn't talk about Africa. I mean, God, come on. I mean, honestly, right? Well, let's look at what happened. What's happened to China with mobile, right? And, and cash. Ridiculous, the, the take up that's happened there. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter what we think, it matters what customers think, right? Marcus, wherever you're at, Bo, I think you got, you're doing fine, right? Betterment, you're doing fine. Monzo, love you, Simon. By the way, half a million customers, I believe, Starling, well done. It, again, it doesn't matter, Jack, what we think. It matters if customers sign up and use it. That's the bottom line. They're going to tell us who wins. And in China, by the way, they're kicking our ass. All right. Uh, okay, guys, uh, this is very exciting because we have the round four winner, and the winner of round four is Europe. So we are tied up, even Stephen, to all right now. And uh, we're going to break now for just a quick 10 minute break. While we are on break, feel free to join the conversation on Twitter about this wonderful debate. It's hashtag WFTR18. When we return, our next section will be exploring collaboration models between fintechs and traditional service firms. And that will begin in just about 10 minutes. So thank you very much. And we're going to take a quick break here and get right back into it. Financial services customers order books, food, and travel with a few simple clicks. They now expect no less from their financial services providers. Fintechs have been enabling new technologies for FS customers, and their profound effect on the industry cannot be underestimated. While fintechs continue to lead the way in transforming the customer journey, the revolution that painted them as competitors is fizzling, as these agile startups realize the struggle of competing alone. The World Fintech Report 2018 from Capgemini and LinkedIn in collaboration with EFMA explores the path forward for fintechs and traditional FS players. It is paved with mutually beneficial collaboration as they adapt and simultaneously brace themselves for the expected big tech expansion into financial services. Both fintechs and traditional firms bring different strengths. Fintechs have achieved their industry foothold by filling gaps left open by bringing innovation to the customer journey. More than 90% of fintechs say that agility and enhanced customer experience are their key competitive advantages, which they say incumbents lack. Incumbents hold customer trust in strong brands, which are the new industry battlegrounds. Traditional firms also bring risk management, regulatory expertise, quick scalability, and financially viable business models, which are elusive to most fintechs. It's becoming obvious that the best way forward is to combine the strengths of fintechs and incumbents through forming symbiotic relationships to meet customers' growing expectations. These collaborations must align with customer goals, build trust, and deliver digital, agile, and efficient processes, such as higher personalization, improved convenience, increased speed of service, intuitive interaction, better functionality, and proactive insights. 
The use of advanced analytics, predictive modeling, and other innovative technologies is also necessary to create offerings that make customers want to return. Successful collaboration will depend on selecting the best partner and engagement model, but a barrier to achieving this has been incumbents' perceived unwillingness and lack of agility, according to a majority of fintech executives. Incumbents' concerns involve a potential negative impact on trust, brand, and internal culture, as well as IT compatibility. One way to encourage successful collaboration is for fintechs to participate in Capgemini's Scale-Up Certification Program a 360-degree review to qualify the most prepared scale-ups for effective collaboration with financial institutions. It will be important for these symbiotic relationships to take hold soon. Before long, big techs such as Amazon, Google, Apple, and Alibaba will be looking to expand their footprint into the industry. Google, Apple, and Amazon have already expanded into the payment space and Alibaba and its subsidiaries is already ahead of the curve, collaborating with a number of traditional players. Other big techs will soon follow. To learn more, download the report at fintechworldreport.com or contact us at financialservices at capgemini.com or jgrazel at linkedin.com. banking in which we've seen that products have been completely commoditized, the only way to make a difference is through an excellent customer experience, a differentiated customer experience. And delivering that differentiating customer experience, it is the global tax that have actually set the bench to our customers and raised the expectations. So if you want to deliver on a differentiating customer experience, in my view, it has to adhere to the four principles of personal, instant, relevant, and seamless. The technologies that, in my view, are going to have the most impact on the customer journey are technologies that on one side help customers to identify themselves, e-identity, authentication of identification cards, uh, face recognition technology, stuff like that, which makes it really easy for customers to onboard into new platforms, new banks. That's one side. And the other side is everything that has to do with artificial intelligence in order to help customers to understand what their behavior delivers in terms of what kind of person they are and therefore what kind of financial advice fits with them so that they feel truly empowered to take the decisions they need to take. In order to build trust in the future, because the trust is affected by the personal relationship, so basically the fact that customers can actually go and visit a branch and can relate to a person. That is fading away with, blanks, with branch closures and people doing more and more online. So the trust factor that comes now in place is the trust factor that has to be built through making sure that whatever advice you render is really recognized as an advice that the customer can relate to as one that is specific, tailored, to its situation, to his or her situation, on the back of the data and the behavior that that customer shows. So the way you have to deliver your services, your products, has to be very personal and has to be very simple and understandable. Only that way, normal people, honestly, and which is 99% of us, will feel empowered to make those financial decisions that they need to take, both in a day-to-day -day banking situation as in invest, uh, related to investing for the future. So every investment that we make and every fintech that we collaborate with, they have to play a role in our strategy. And our strategy is to deliver a differentiating experience to our customers. So every fintech, everything they can bring on board that is actually geared towards their strategy is one that we want to collaborate with, that we want to invest in. This can be in specific areas like payments, like aggregation or robo-advice, but it can be broader as well. The way you work with fintechs though is different per fintech. Some are a little bit bigger, they have their own standards, they have different banks they work with already, and some are starting from scratch. 
and they're looking for an inroad into a bank uh, actually to test their technology. So depending on where they are in their own development, you have to work with them in a different way. The biggest challenges are on both sides of uh, this collaboration. On one side, you'll have to explain to FinTechs that we're not a lab in which they can experiment to the max. We're dealing with real customers, with real customer information. So whenever we release something, it can't be just a trial, uh, uh, because we have a brand to protect, a promise to protect. On the other side, the challenge is also on the internal side. Uh, clearly, you know, if you're an established bank, um, uh, motivating your people to collaborate with fintechs sometimes is difficult uh, from many different angles. First, fintechs work much faster, uh, they're much more agile, and therefore you have to change the culture yourself. And that's exactly what we've been doing. Over the last three, four years, we've been truly changing the internal culture to not only innovate ourselves, but also to make sure that the collaboration with the fintechs works really well. Welcome back. So I hope everyone is refreshed and raring to go. So we're now going to move on to our second set of questions, all of which will address the topic of collaboration models between fintechs and traditional financial services firms. Our first question in this section is one that's sure to be right up the European team's street. How are challenger banks making their mark right now? And we're going to go straight over to Richard for the European team's opening position on this one. Great. Thanks, Sarah. So. I guess you've got to start with what is a challenger bank. So you've got three types to my mind. You've got the branch and digital banks like Metro Bank in the UK or TSB, my own bank. You've got the digital only banks. We've heard from Simon from Monzo, had mentioned the Starling as well. 
And then you've got the front end banks, the neo banks um, that are sitting on top of other banks, or with open banking, I think we'll see a lot more of this. People like Penta in Germany doing small business banking on Solaris' rails. So then the question is, what, what mark is all that making? So you've got a huge, diverse ecosystem of challenges out there. And I think you've got to measure that by sort of two things. One is customer adoption. And you kind of look at the likes of Monzo with half a million customers, Revolut with one and a half million customers. You look at Klarna in Northern Europe in e-commerce, got 10% now market share of e-commerce and 60 million end users. Or ourselves as TSB, we've lent 10 billion, 10 billion pounds uh, in mortgage lending in the last three years. So there is, I think, real impact there across that range of challenges from a people actually using it. But I think it's also a question of beachheads for a lot of companies where they are looking to really get in, so Revolut with a prepaid card and FX, and then build out a much fuller range of services thereafter. So some of the impact is, is very much still to come. And I guess you can also measure impact in terms of the incumbent banks, be it in Europe, be it in the US, and imitation is clearly the greatest form of flattery. And you see quite a lot of investment now, particularly in mobile apps, from the big incumbents trying to copy a lot of the features that the challenges are coming up with. So I do think there is a pretty huge range of impact now coming from the challenges, at least in Europe. So I did um, have a quick look at a survey from Cybos Money 2020 in preparation for this, and uh, top 50 digital-only banks in the world. There was uh, 22 from China and Asia and Africa to back up the comment made just before the break. There was 23 from Europe, and there was only five from North America. So you guys got some work to do. Thank you very much, Richard. So to answer that question, we're going to send it over to Zach in the US. So when I think about impact, I don't think about usage. I think about impact in terms of how you help your customer. So when we look at these challenger banks, especially in Europe, how many of the underbanked are now banking? How many people who weren't saving for retirement are now saving and investing for retirement? And how many customers have these challenger banks actually helped pay down and get out, get out of debt? And so that's how I define impact. And so using that lens, I have seen largely a failure of challenger banks and other institutions that have meaningful impact on a lot of challenges of general consumers. And so when I think about the impact that they have had, it has changed the conversation. So I love that we're having a conversation more focused on the customer, more focused on how we use technology to serve customers. And that has created, I think, a fire in the belly, not just in some of the demographics of challenger banks that you articulated, but also in ones that are larger banks, like Goldman Sachs, our friend Bo from Marcus. And in some ways, when I think of the firm I work for, USAA. In many ways, we've been a challenger bank since we founded, and I'd like to share some of those principles. Uh, one, we were customer-centric before customer-centric was cool and became a tagline to sell something like an AI-based chatbot. For three decades, we were a virtual bank with no branches. Our customers could not come see us. And so along the way, we used technology. We invented something called remote deposit capture, which enabled you to take a picture of a check and deposit it because we trusted our members enough that they wouldn't cheat us. And guess what? They didn't because they trust us. And so when I look at a challenger, uh, we are a challenger in terms of how we approach serving our customers. And I would just offer back out to all those folks who call themselves challengers, what impact are you having on consumers? And are you just saying, I'm consumer friendly and using technology? Or are you actually doing that? And I want to add to that. This Um, Thank you so much, oh Zach. So, uh, in summary, though, we've got challenger Whoa, banks like gaining ground when it comes to customer acquisition, but there's still a way to go when it comes to social impact. Uh, so, if you like what you heard and you think that one side has the edge there, please do remember to head over to Twitter to vote. And whilst you're doing that, I'm going to hand it over to Simon Taylor, who's going to deliver the EU's rebuttal. You know, I absolutely love that Sam wants to talk right now. 
That's that's making my whole world. <laughs> Sam, I can feel you really, really wanting to talk. I'm just going to remind the world that Sam wants to talk. And if you want to vote for Europe about the fact that I'm mocking Sam that he wants to talk, go right ahead. It's right there on the screen how you vote for Europe to win. Um, <laughs> So uh, what are challenger banks doing? Well, I don't know if you've heard of pocket or monies, but actually they serve migrant workers who couldn't get bank accounts. And the problem with not being able to have a bank account when you migrate into a country is then you can't get a mobile phone contract, oh. which often means you can't get a place to rent, which often means you can't get a mortgage or anything else that you need that's the basic essentials of living. So what are they doing? They're making real differences to people's lives. They are having customer impact. And I do think they're serving underserved segments. I also think a lot of the challenges banks are competing on service because they don't have a high legacy cost. Uh, they don't have to pay for infrastructure and hundreds of thousands of people. They can actually have a different business model. And that's really powerful and expresses it in interesting ways. Rather than it being like a bad landlord, Right, rather than it being, I'm going to charge you and here's a fee and we're going to make money off your FX and we're going to hide all of these fees from you, which a lot of the incumbent banks still do, then Challenger banks could be really transparent because they're making money because they have a low cost base. There's more space for headroom. There's more, more space for revenue and profit with a lower cost of operating. So they're also making a difference in terms of, I didn't get surprised by the fact that I got charged. And they can do something else because they've got modern infrastructure. They can be real time, intelligent, and contextual. What do I mean by that? Well. I, a lot of banks don't know until the day after that money left my bank account and I may have gone overdrawn and I may have had a hidden fee. In fact, Simon Vance Kalina talked to that. Now imagine the impact of somebody's life of that. Imagine if that means I'm not only have I gone overdrawn, but I've got a relationship where uh, I'm paying living day to day and there's too much month left at the end of the money. Now I find myself in a position where maybe I can't make rent, maybe I'm having bad life consequences, maybe I'm suffering from poor mental health as a result of not knowing where I am just because my bank has bad technology. And you'd be surprised how common that is. Two out of six people in the UK right now are suffering some form of concern about money. They're really dealing with mental anguish from concern about money. So being proactive, being real time, being intelligent and contextual really makes a difference for customers. And that's what challenges are doing that old fashioned banks can't do. Woo! Oh, yeah. Thank you very much, Simon. So we're going to go back to Dan for the US's rebuttal. Simon. Oh, Simon. Simon, I love you. All right. So for Team USA, real quick, um, a good point that was raised by um, the, the first comment about uh, only five U.S. companies when we're talking about challengers in tech. But unfortunately, those five would be like Amazon, Facebook, Google, Walmart, Apple. Netflix. Take a pick. Uh, so I'm going to harp on a slightly different way of looking at it in terms of the size of the impact that challenger banks have, not within their own customers, but across the entire service space. Uh, so when Elon Musk founded Tesla, he very clearly said the purpose of this is not actually to make a very valuable company. It is to accelerate the rate at which we adopt electric vehicles and to get the technology rolling very quickly. big example of that is that he... Um, so I call it, he made the patents for all of his technology public. You can actually use Elon Musk's patent to build your own electric cars. And that's why we see a lot of the big companies, Ford, GM, et cetera, building electric cars using those patents. I've been with Betterment for, four, for five years now. When I joined, we were the only person doing this in our space. We were the only online advisor who was able to do it. Um, over that period of time, not only has every large bank entered it into it to try and offer a robo-advisor, they've done it while bringing their own costs down, while cannibalizing their own revenue streams. Generally speaking, an innovator or an entrant who decides that they want to serve customers directly by doing the right thing, by lowering cost, increasing efficiency, or providing a higher quality of service, has dramatic impact because they raise the standards that everybody else has to live by. If a startup that's VC-backed can do this, why can't some of the largest banks with the biggest balance sheets in the country do it? Anybody else? <laughs> Thank you for the um, team response there. That was a, a two-party two -party approach. Um, so to give us a little bit of a wrap-up on that round, we now have Elias. Sam, first, come on. You don't need to steal the space to try to put your hat in front. Show us your socks. I think it's much better for you. So what do challenging banks do? They challenge banks. Let's look at all the banks that we have in Europe that are in the million of customers, half a million, a million. Monzo, 
N26, Klarna is way beyond, Starling banks, and so on and so forth. Transferwise, are all these banks, or these challenging banks, are making banks easier, are making banks more engaging, are creating the right experience. Clearly, traditional banks, the study in Europe, in France, that had shown that, Bain and Company had shown that French banks have not got new customers since 2015. It doesn't mean there's no customers, but not going to traditional banks. They are going somewhere. These guys are banking. If you look also what's happening in France, you have Comte Nickel, who's now opening bank account outside of the bank. It's banks everywhere, but not in a branch. All that is about the changing bank. Great, thank you everyone. And now we're gonna go back over to Jill, who's gonna take us into round seven. Okay, first, we must do a little business here. Round five, so the first hour of our debate, has now been decided. Round five goes to Europe. So they won three rounds, the Americas won two rounds. Got some business to do here, gang. Remember, you can vote via Twitter, just uh, follow the directions on your screen and weigh in at hashtag WFTR18. We are now into round seven. Uh, fintech firms, obviously the big disruptors. And in the Capgemini LinkedIn fintech report, these firms actually say their agility and ability to provide enhanced customer experience are their key competitive advantages. So our question for round seven, how can traditional financial institutions accelerate and improve their engagement with startups so that they can tap into these advantages? For the US, opening position, Jeff, take it away. Thanks, Jill. So I think the first question um, and the mistake that I think often firms uh, of all, all sizes make is they, they sort of view the technology as pixie dust and that somehow if they sprinkle it on their organization that this, this wonderful thing uh, will, will occur. And you know you can't get away from understanding what, what is your strategy, what's your competitive advantage, and how do you use technology to enable that. So at a small company like Morgan Stanley, uh, we we think that our core value proposition is is our human is our human financial advisors. And by the way, I can actually tell you through all of our data and, and analysis that people still like to, to communicate with people. And so the question doesn't become how do we use technology to replace that value proposition? The question becomes, how do we use technology to augment that relationship? And really driving insights and scale so that human being can have more human conversations. And I will tell you that I'm the chief analytics officer. We use random forest equations to drive really innovative things. But I can tell you the single most powerful thing that a financial advisor can do today is uh, take someone to lunch or pick up the phone and call a client. and then. You enable that relationship with, uh, with technology. Uh, the second thing I'd, I'd say is that you have to know what you can outsource and what you, have, what you can't outsource. You cannot outsource your data management uh, issues. You cannot outsource sort of defining what your value proposition is. And what we see time and time again in talking to my peers is people really try to overcome those problems and try to hand that off to somebody else. Nobody can define your strategy. And then the last thing I'll say is you need an infrastructure to really engage the velocity, uh, you know, with, with velocity around this. So we were out in Silicon Valley six months ago. I met with 30 machine learning based uh, organizations that are trying to really, really sort of move the needle in this space. And after you talk to 30 companies, you get a really good sense. And, and really understanding how you can vet those opportunities and ultimately, because you can hear everyone saying, well, I'll talk a good game. The only way you really know who's, who's real and who's not is you got to test. And that means you've got to invest dollars of your organizational money to actually vet and, and determine whether these technologies are real or whether they're just vapor. Thank you very much, Jeff. And now for the opening EU position, we are going to Claire. So the first point is really have a purpose uh, when you engage the startups. And for us, it was about partnering with Startup Bootcamp Fintech, and Nectarius is going to do our revital here. Um, and over the last three years, we created around 30 companies, 
um, that have an average revenue of 2.2 million. One of them is called Wayope, and when they started in the accelerators, they were very early stage, way too early stage to engage a bank like Lloyds Banking Group. But you know what? We had coffee suppliers all around the country, and they were a way to pay at your fingertips and order your coffee, and then you just pick up the coffee by beating, and beating the queue. Um, they've been running in our coffee operation for like two years, and two years after, they've been approached by our main business as, oh, by the way, do you want to form part of our offering? And today, they are part of the offering of Floyd's Banking Group. So the story goes, you know, by doing some things that was quite disinterested at the beginning to just help a startup to progress and to just like, you know, make them, make the fintech ecosystem flourishing in the UK, to beef up and to finally be part of the ecosystem of Floyd's Banking Group. Um, the second part is really think, think big. Uh, you know, one of the things we did as well was launching our fintech mentoring activities, uh, which is like we pledge 100 of our top senior uh, MDs in Lloyd's Banking Group and we match them with startup. It's quite inorganic. We don't really have a purpose when we do that. Uh, we just hope this business grow and flourish because we just see this as an interest for the country about growing talent, about delivering it. So I think, you know, my main message is to really, you know, think around the purpose when you do this engagement um, and, and follow a bit like your heart when you do that and not just the economic reality about it. Um, but let's elevate the debate a little bit because I think you know, we're talking about startups and this nimble startup and surely you know, incumbents are startups are things to share about the culture, about our ways of working and about the expertise banks have you know, in terms of regulation and you know, customer experience. Um, but I think you know, one of the environments we don't talk about is the Bafas and the GET. So how do we engage you know, this technology company that are currently serving the customer? And I was in China recently, and I really think there is something that we need to tap into it. And I will expand that and say, like, the party just get bigger. Why are we just talking about fintech and incumbent? You know, why are we not talking about every part of the chain that is there? Why are we not talking about the government, about the regulator, about the fintech, about the startup, about the VCs? And this is what we've done in the UK by putting them all together around the table, around the UK fintech panel, and say, OK, guys, how do we? Okay, that is a lot to swallow for uh, the opening positions. Uh, if you would like to vote, just follow the instructions at the bottom of the screen. Hop onto Twitter, vote for either the Americans or the Europeans, or you can wait for the rebuttals. Um, and um, delivering our rebuttal for the Americas is Jane. So I'm very fortunate to represent the voice of the founder. And I know there's a bunch of founders in the room. And often these conversations about how to fin how do fintechs collaborate with financial institutions, it's 90% financial institution and 10% fintech. And guess what? Like, it's not a big secret, but for founders and for fintechs, time is money. When you have a two-year buying cycle, that's not good for me. It's <laughs> really, really not. And so I was very heartened to see the Capgemini announcement today about the certification program. So less so startups, more so scale-ups being certified around, you know, are they real businesses? Are they ready to engage? All of this is awesome. What I would love to see is a similar process on the other side. And Capgemini, you can give me some rev share for this idea because it's really good. Um, <laughs> so is your institution actually ready to engage? And like the questions that at the C-suite are answered very easily, once you get into the weeds of the operators, it gets very messy. So, you know, is there room in the roadmap for this? Can be answered by everybody. And generally the answer is no, but it's something we're interested in next year. Guess what? Doesn't really help me because next year can come around and then it gets pushed to the next year. Mm. Is there money for Jane? Like, that's kind of important. Again, the answer is often no, but it's a huge priority for us. It's like, OK, so where is this really? Um, the third really big thing is, you know, what is your process? And often you focus on the pointy end of the process for startups. It's the innovation teams. It's maybe product, maybe C-suite, maybe customer experience. Our time is actually spent with your risk, compliance, marketing, legal, PR teams, and that can take you know three weeks to get a meeting set up. And so be really aware of how long things take, because if just to get to the MOU takes six months, nine months, maybe a year, then you can assume it's going to take a whole lot longer after that. So in order to accelerate, have a process that can actually get you in there faster. And there's another whole big thing, again, taking it out of scale-ups and back to startups. I think it's clear from the data that the venture world funds the hopes and dreams of 28-year-old white men, right? <laughs> so if you're putting 
women and people of color through the same process as you put the startups that raised 100 million in venture, then you can take your, we really care about diversity and you know where you can put it because the money needs to follow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Woo, time's up. Okay, uh, thank you very much, that was brilliant. Uh, for the European rebuttal, Nectarius. Damn you, Jane, you're take, taking away all my arguments. Um, let's start with a different question. I'm looking at all of you who are watching this and have an innovation role in a bank, who talk about all the appetite that you have about working with FinTechs because it's cool and you've got labs and garages and bean bags and post-its. If I bring the best startup in the world that solves a real problem to you and they're enterprise ready, they've proven the technology, they've got customers, and I put them in front of you and say, go, what are you going to do? How long is it going to take? How long are you going to excite the right people? Are you going to make the money available? And all the things that Jane talked about. Because you're absolutely rubbish at doing this. And let's not kid anybody. Reality is that most startup engagements with the large organizations frizzle out because of the inability of the industry to engage. Nothing to do with the startups. They're keen. They want to learn. They want to talk. None of the founders we talk to want to bypass the industry or bypass regulation. They want to have a fair chance in this. But reality is that despite all the appetite, despite all the noise, all the conferences, all the panel conversations, all the cool tapping on each other's shoulders, talking about how amazingly innovative we are. Oh, we are a technology company with a banking license. Rubbish. Reality is you're not ready. You have no appetite. Sorry. You have no capability beyond the appetite. And you don't sit down and think, what is it that we need to build to actually get to that point? How do we bridge that huge chasm between appetite and capability? And there's lots of things you can do. And there's a lot of organizations who are trying. And nobody has figured it out, but at least people try. But there's a lot of people now who go, you know what? And we're talking heads of innovation who say, you know what? Don't tell me what I'm doing is wrong. I've sold my strategy to the board. I'm not touching this now. Seriously, 2018, FinTech, is this your strategy? How do you measure success? How do you actually figure out what works and what doesn't work? How do you get the business excited enough to actually put money towards it? Because the innovation budget is actually shrinking. So all these things nobody's addressing. So all this talk about collaboration is noise because nobody's actually doing something about it. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's it. I have 24 seconds left, but I've got nothing else to say. Thank you very much. OK, uh, Shanker, our, one of our co-captains here in the Americas, how about a quick summary? Thank you. Uh, that was a pretty uh, interesting conversation. Uh, so I think that one cannot do without the other. I think the future is all about how do we have a hybrid model. You can have a smart idea, two guys in a garage, no customers and no data, screw you. You're worth nothing. So you need the banks to take their customers and data and make something out of it. And also, I've heard these banks are departing forever. Actually, when I saw this morning, they're better capitalized and stronger than two decades ago. And the spider is actually doing tracking well compared to tech stocks, which are actually tracking the other way. So I think that everybody is right and everybody is wrong. I think the two of us have to come together and kind of, uh, and I agree the point that with a lot of banks, it takes time to bring in the startup, but that's because what happens if the startup is out of business? Who's going to bail the bank out? So that's where the entire ecosystem needs to play ball and come together like never before, so that the smart ideas go to the bank, germinate quickly, faster. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, all right, now, here in the Americas, we're gonna have the work to do, because we have our round six winner is Europe. Oh, it's very subdued here, a very sad face. There they are. Uh, I, I, I don't know what they're doing. They're doing some sort of Olympics dance, I think. Uh, if you'd like to vote, head to Twitter, follow the directions at the bottom of your screen. And now we're going to go over to Sarah, who will introduce round eight. Thank you very much, Jill. An excellent work, Team Europe. Let's see if we can keep going, keep that winning streak going. So we're going to move on to round eight now. Um, we all know that one of the most important elements for the success of any innovation project is a supportive culture. And that's even more key when multiple parties are involved. So our eighth question will dig into this subject matter. What role does talent and culture play in a successful fintech incumbent collaboration? And to kick us off on this, we're going over to Claire. So talent is critical. People are critical in this story. I think we've sorted out, you know, since the beginning of this debate. 
Um, and I think if you really take only one action out of all this debate, please go online and pledge for the fintech parity because one of the key issues we have in fintech is really around our diversity. The recent report of McKinsey shows that companies that are diverse perform 21% better and 32% better if they are ethnicity diverse. It is a call to action. You know, we cannot just stand still. If we want to match the customer base, if we want to engage our talents, if we want to serve the best service for the customer, we have to become diverse. We have to bring these different talents. I've led innovation team for five, four and a half years. And I remember Sam interviewing me one day and say, hey Claire, did you realize your team is coming from all across the world? And I was like, uh-huh, I didn't really realize that or I didn't do it intentionally. We just went to hunt the best talent to make it happen. And they were coming from everywhere in the world, Australia, America, you know, like Poland, um, Africa. They were all coming together to build these best services. Talent is key. The second thing is culture. We've been talking about it, disrupting the old ways of working. We've been talking about bureaucracy. We've been talking about you know, what are the challenges in this startup incumbent engagement? How do you do that? How do you become nimble? How do you take the leap of faith for organizations that are very hierarchically wired and start to be a connected organization? How do you drive different type of thinking, what we call the double loop thinking, and you don't get stuck in the simple loop thinking? How do you go, don't just go after incremental, but you actually motivate your people to achieve the best outcome for the customer and to come with the, the, the best solution and how do you enable your organization to, to do that through and through? It is a tough challenge. There is no silver bullet about it. I've been asked for the last five years, you know, what is the magic recipe? There is none of it. You will have to put all your efforts in order to, to, to do that. We've built academies, we've built culture and transformation programs. We just have to keep pushing all together to make it better. Thank you very much, Claire. Now we're going to go over to Zach in the US for their opening position. So I, I completely agree with, with Claire, although I would, I would look at the, the, the need for, for talent and diversity as really part of culture and what you champion. Um, because I, I'm a firm believer that the culture of the firm will eat anything and everything around it. And if you do not have a healthy culture, it doesn't matter how many startups you bring in, how much you desire change, you won't be able to. And so as a leader in innovation, much of my job is around culture uh, and leading change. And when I think about culture, it's about a sense of purpose. It's about a sense of being bigger than something um, than yourself. And I see that in, in some startups. It's hard at times to find in large incumbents. Uh, and I've been fortunate to find in the company I work for today. And so we ground ourselves back in our culture, which are mission and purpose. And so every morning I wake up and I don't think about technology. The first thoughts in my mind are around service and service the customer. Um, and then secondarily, I look at how do we leverage technology in order to enable that. And that's where I find the opportunity um, talking to startups, candidly talking to large technology firms and other corporates. Um, their challenge in terms of their why, in terms of what they're doing. Uh, I get 100 emails a day from someone trying to sell me uh, an AI-based chatbot, uh, blockchain-based uh, PFM app uh, that will finally work. Um, but what I've found is when I've paused and talked to founders who understand our why, who understand our purpose and have a connection back to the service that we provide to our customers, our members, um, that's where I find we could do very meaningful things. And that's actually where I find where we can break down all those interior barriers because when you have a culture of your firm that is perfectly aligned against service and service the customer, it is amazing what you can break down from legacy technology to legacy norms to old ways of thinking. But if your partner, your fintech partner or other technology firms aren't aligned in your purpose, it will fail at some point. And so when I think of, uh, when I think of fintech partnerships that have worked, it's where there's true alignment behind the why of the work they were doing and that's grounded back in the culture and the purpose of the firm that I work for. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zach. So in summary there, we have that diversity is absolutely key, but so is ensuring a cultural synergy. Um, just to remind you that you can and should be voting, especially if you're voting for Team Europe. Um, and whilst you're thinking about Ooh. that, <laughs> we're going to move over to Nectarius, who's going to give us the rebuttal from the EU team. So why are people shy of actually talking about some of the other things? Um, 
none of the shareholders in a bank care about innovation or culture change. Uh, innovation is a tick box, and most people act on that. Because if you start really meaning what you want to do, you need to change incentives in the people to actually do innovation. And trust me, nobody in the business has real incentives to actually do something that will affect change. One thing. The other one is that we're in an industry, and I come from the industry, where research and development is not something we do. So innovation doesn't fit anywhere, because ultimately we are in, a, in an environment where we need to enable and establish a mindset of experimentation. Experimentation is not going to lead to ROI instantly, and we already have a problem there because people are only incentivized by cost savings or ROI. So structurally, the whole governance of a bank, and take pretty much any bank in the world, doesn't work. It's not built to actually encourage and effect culture change. Uh, the majority of the business that we do is working with large organizations. So we actually have relationships with about 250 uh, blue chip companies around the world. So we talk to these people. We actually have got access to C-suite. And guess what? We have got one case where the CEO, the CFO, and the CTO signed off of an engagement. And then he got stuck in the permafrost of senior management who have absolutely no appetite. And guess what? When it comes to the 2% of whatever is part of the innovation remit and the kind of conflicts with other priorities, the first thing to fall off the table is change. So this is not going to work. It's not set up to work. So the companies that really mean it, they're also looking to change some of the very fundamentals where they increase the visibility of their activities and not just to tick a box. So for me, the big question is, culture change is important and culture is important and we can do all these beautiful things that excite the population within the bank. But guess what? At some point, it gets stuck somewhere because you have no avenue to actually grow it. If you follow the big leaders on innovation who we used to talk about technology and, and fintech and all the other things, and nowadays they talk about organizational change, which is the only thing that can actually allow this industry to evolve. But at the moment, I'm very pessimistic. End of my contribution. Ooh. Thank you, Nectarius. Some fighting talk there, I think, perhaps. Um, so now we're going to head over to Catherine in the US for her rebuttal. Obviously, I approach this from a fintech perspective. Um, and talent it seems really obvious to us. Yes, you have to have really smart, bright, talented people in order to make these relationships work with banks. And cultural alignment is really important. And from our perspective and in our experience, um, when the relationships work really well, it's because inside the bank, the the initiative is being led from the top. So we saw Ralph Hammers earlier, I believe, during the break, talking about what, what's important to ING. We partner with ING, and we know for a fact that he's out there talking to people and getting people excited and engaging in the culture and creating um, a culture where people can take risks. But culture, I think many people think, is all about ping pong and beer. Like Nectario said earlier, I've been through many, many innovation labs at banks, and right in the middle is a ping pong table, and then they are excited to walk you over to the beer cooler where there's four bottles of beer you know, stuck in the cooler. But it's really not about that. It's really about innovation, I think, and risk taking. And, I, and so what banks are attracted to with fintechs is our ability to innovate um, and to take risks, which we, which we do because we adhere to some guiding principles. Um, in our case, we actually walked away from a big bank partner because we were going to have to um, to walk away from our guiding principles in order to make that relationship work, and it wasn't worth it to us. I think the second thing culturally that's really important about working with a large institution from a fintech's perspective is to have a culture of compliance. So I don't know if you all remember the Mother's Day massacre, which is a couple of years ago, and all the um, details of some of the issues around Lending Club came out. The problem with what happened there was that it impacted the entire fintech space. Because suddenly, whether it was the capital markets, or what was the bank partners, or whether it was the investors, everybody was worried that suddenly fintechs didn't understand compliance. And I know that. Um, Clara mentioned earlier, as did Suresh, that compliance is a really important aspect. So the culture of compliance means that you understand how to approach compliance with a bank partner. There are two types of compliance. There's regulatory compliance and there's process compliance. Regulatory compliance is just something you have to do, whether it's AML or KYC, or whether it's disclosures to your customers, you just have to do it. Process compliance is really the problem. It's where there's a whole room full of people who say, oh, you have to check this box every time you do a thing. And if you don't check the box, then there's going to be trouble. Well, why do you have to check the box? Well, because some dude 70 years ago decided we had to check the box, and that's just why we do it. So it's really important culturally to push back against that type of process compliance to make sure that you can actually achieve everybody's objectives. Thank you very much for that, Catherine. So uh, Elias, could you give us a quick summary of your thoughts on round eight? 
Risk taking, I think it's clearly the main message that we got across the last uh, debate. But so let me put that in a very simple way. What's MVP stands for? When you're a startup, it's the minimal viable product. When you're a bank, it's the maximal viable product. So when you start this way, it's very difficult to bring these two together. Startups need to be in the market, needs to run, need to test. Banks need to make sure that it, it will not fail. So this is where the culture starts. And the more we bring these two cultures together, the more we help them, we orchestrate this gathering, the more we'll get them together. Clearly, both sides need each other. Banks today need startups to innovate. Innovates needs bank to scale. So bring them together is the way, and culture is what will bring them together to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Elias. So now we're going to go back to my US counterpart for both the results of the round seven vote and an intro into round nine. Uh, Elias, I just want to let you know for the aging athletes in this room, the only thing that MVP means is most valuable player. And so I just want to get that out there. Round seven, the winner is the Americas. <laughs> Don't forget to go on to Twitter so you can vote. Use the hashtags at the bottom of your screen and weigh in on the conversation. Hashtag WFTR18. We are coming into round nine, two rounds remaining. This is exciting. Rapid change in technology challenges upstarts and established firms alike. Boundaries between companies and industries are becoming blurred. And so our question for round nine is this. Who will be the long-term winner as banking evolves to a marketplace model? incumbents, fintechs, or big tech. And as a follow-up, we, as we consider big tech's strong relationship with consumers and efficiency in creating frictionless tech transactions, are Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, GAFA, a threat or a partner or enabler? Now, uh, we just happen to have a Facebook pro a woman who actually wrote a book about Facebook on our panel and putting out the opening statement for the Americas, Clara Shy. So again, as before, let's talk about digital only and digital advised. For digital only, um, I think the challenge for fintech players is that they're going to have to get to scale really quickly in order to be able to, to matter and not be subsumed by a copycat incumbent. Um, you, it's possible. You look at other industries like Uber and Lyft, they've raised massive amounts of money um, and because so those early years, the early decade is really about client acquisition and building your brand. So it is possible. Um, I do think that also um, big techs have a, a big advantage. If you look at China, um, the two biggest fintech players are WeChat and Alibaba, started off as tech companies. Um, the consumer relationship alone isn't enough. You actually have to have a consumer payment relationship um, in order to be able to grow as a fintech. In both cases, they started off, um, in, in the WeChat case, with uh, virtual goods, getting people's payment method through virtual goods. In the Alibaba case, very, very similar to Amazon, doing transactions for e-commerce. So for the big techs to win um, in America or in, in Europe, we'd have to make sure that you have the payment method. Now let's talk about digital advised um, for a moment. So digital advised, I think no one today really would be really difficult for any upstart today to be able to raise the capital and justify building 5,000 branch locations, hiring 20,000 human advisors. And so I think here, the incumbents will have a real advantage in terms of they already have that infrastructure in place. Their challenge will be getting the profitability and, and improving uh, productivity as margin um, pressures continue to increase. And I think that, that, that it's possible, but there, we should expect to see over time industry consolidation. Um, in general, for both digital only as well as digital advised, given the nature of technology, the economies of scale required to, um, to build a marketplace, two-sided mar marketplace, multi-sided marketplace, as well as the, the network effects inherent in anything technology, we'll, see, we'll start to see a, um, overall convergence because technology is generally winner takes all. That's why there's only Uber and Lyft very few number of players in that space. That's why there's only Amazon, Facebook. There's only one Amazon, one Facebook, one Google. We should expect to see the same thing in financial services. Thank you. OK. Uh, and for the Europeans opening position, we are going to Richard. Great. So let me talk, first of all, from the bank perspective. So. A lot of people would say marketplace is not a new thing. 
banks have sold add-ons like insurance or small business software for decades. Um, that's kind of true, but it's sort of totally missing the point. Today, you can create so much better customer experience via fully integrated frictionless processes to bring much wider services contextually to a customer. And I think there's also something about mindset here for a bank. You've got to be prepared to offer customers choice. And that choice is not just on add-on stuff you don't do yourself as a bank. It is about choice in the products you do yourself. Let's talk about Amazon for a second. Amazon does this with Amazon Marketplace. Amazon has its own products on Amazon and it offers third-party products. And it provides you an easy comparison of the two. And that provides better customer experience, provides customer trust, and it also provides great data for Amazon to improve their own product set. But actually, this isn't really that much about banks, this question. The question is about, really, is Gaffer going to take over financial services? And I guess, to my mind, the question is just wrong. We've talked about China a fair bit. We actually need to kind of talk about China a lot more, because this is not about Google, Amazon, Facebook. This is about Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent. I've been uh, to China a couple of times uh, in the last year, and you go to Hangzhou with Alibaba, or you go to Shenzhen with Tencent, and you kind of see the future. Tencent has a super app via WeChat that includes payments. You can book a doctor, you can invest in a fund, you can book a restaurant, you can split a bill, you can order that restaurant, you can go on and on. The range of jobs to be done is astonishing. You can do it through this one app. So, I guess you kind of look at Facebook, 95% of the revenue comes from advertising off social media. It's a great social media site. But Tencent, it's only 25% comes advertising. 75% it's a much wider range of services. So I guess from my point of view, you've really got to look east for the future, not west. And I, for one, welcome our Alipay masters. <laughs> All right, well said. Uh, really interesting to bring this up. Uh, I think that uh, many of us feel like those big names are taking over the world. It's nice to know there are other large names that will be taking over the world instead. All right, maybe it's not that nice. Uh, remember, you can vote right now. Go to Twitter. Use the hashtags at the bottom of your screen. And now let's get to our rebuttal for the Americas. We've got Bo, who will be speaking first. So this is actually one of my favorite questions. Um, I can remember sitting in uh, London a couple years ago, and the question was, well, isn't Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google and others going to dis uh, disenfranchise or disintermate the banks from their customers? And it was actually a really, really intense and robust debate in that time. And in the room, I actually kind of started chuckling because I thought to myself, that's actually incorrect. Everybody wants to create this battlefield of the incumbent banks, the fintechs, and the large tech companies. And I think that's actually very wrong. And if we talk about the roadmap, let's talk about the roadmap. So the legacy banks, you want to talk about stickiness in customers? That's the legacy banks, right? I mean, I, you know, God, uh, you know, I salute all the fintechs around the world, big supporters. But the population uses the legacy banks to do the banking. Now, innovation, right? So you have scale on the legacy side, but innovation comes from the fintechs. And I, for one, am excited and actually very supportive of the fact that fintechs took the courage and creation to jump out there into the market and actually be R&D and actually create great customer experiences. And that, to me, is not an adversarial relationship because I remember several years ago it was the fintechs are going to eat all the big banks. We have scale. We have the funds. The fintechs have the innovation. It's a partnership. And when I came to Marcus, uh, by Goldman Sachs, that's actually my first step, was how do I actually bring together not only the people who understood regulation and compliance for banks, because you need that, regardless of what anybody would like to think, and you need the innovation of the fintechs. And that together creates a marriage of how you put customers first and you bring them the best functionality as you move forward. Then let's bring in the big players, Facebook, Google, Amazon, I'd even throw Microsoft in that as well. Right? They own incredible customer experience. They own it, and people flock to use their services because they provide their services for free. All of them have attempted to become banks, and they've all backed away from it. Why? It's hard. And there's a reason why it's hard. is because it's very important, and you have to be responsible and focused on that. Hmm. And to me, 
that actually is an opportunity for partnership. So I don't think that there's this adversarial, you know, dog eat dog battle that's going on. I actually think it's massively convergent. These big players want to go a little bit deeper, as a colleague in Europe has said, deeper in the relationship and deeper in the experience. As Claire was pointing out, technology will eat the world, right? And folks are moving to that. You can see it in Africa and other places as well. And to me, the roadmap ends where these three converge, and we actually create an incredible new platform. Oh, we just made it right under the bell. Okay, let's go over to Europe where Jamie will deliver the rebuttal. Well, let me tell you about that incredible new platform. Um, so two and a half years ago, we started Bud because we noticed uh, one big thing, which was FinTech was on the rise and people were getting better experiences in each of these new product verticals. You had TransferWise making uh, remittance much better and a much better experience and for better rates. You had Nutmegs and other robo-advisors who were making uh, investment easier for, for customers. Uh, and across the board, you had all these new companies uh, you know, who were developing these new products and services in their own individual vertical. But customers don't really want to go and get another app for one thing and multiple different apps for all these different services. The mass customer is used to going to one place for all of their financial services, their bank. So Bud was created as a way of combining all of these new product innovations across the fintech space, integrating those services into our platform, and making that platform available to banks so that they can distribute these new amazing products to their customers. I think when you look at something like this, this model which we call marketplace banking here in, in, in the UK, really it's Europe and UK who are pioneering these new methodologies and, and getting these new uh, products to market in a, in a new way. You have challenger banks like Monzo and N26 who have already kind of put their flag in the ground saying that they're going to be doing marketplace models. And really it's borrowing from the experience of the likes of Amazon and, uh, and even travel companies like Expedia. Look at the way that they revolutionized those, uh, those markets by bringing all of these services together in a new way, making customers incredibly aware of all the services that were available to them, giving them choice. And that choice gives them power and it gives them information that they can uh, take and inform their lives and have better experiences at, at the outcome. I think when you really look at the heart of you know, who is going to kind of swoop into financial services and, uh, and, and, and take the crown, really I, can't, I don't think you can look at uh, the Facebooks and the Amazons because when you, you know, look deep down in these companies, where do they keep their money? In a bank. You know, it's not going to change. And I think by partnering with platform uh, companies such as ourselves, banks will start to have a new ticket to the game, uh, which will allow them to be innovative, uh, will allow them to be agile, and serve their customers in a brand new way. OK. Uh, they keep their money in a bank, usually an offshore one, at least for the time being. Uh, OK, Sam, how about articulating a little recap for us? So the question is, who will be the long-term winner as banking evolves to marketplace models, incumbents, fintechs, or big techs? I don't care. Um, wow. the, the customer. I mean, seriously, the, the customer. Everybody's going to win. The, but at the end of the day, the customer should win. We're seeing this in China, right? A whole um, uh, uh, a group actually now being raised up, right? They're middle class emerging. Um, we've seen this in Africa with M-Pesa. That's what these solutions need to do. Nectorius talked about it. I think Simon hit on it. Jamie uh, evidently didn't get product for his hair today. It's the smallest I've ever seen his hair. Um, but that's who needs to win at the end of the day, providing these services to the masses. Thank you very much. Okay, we have a very curious event here. Uh, we have the round eight coming in at a tie which means we'll have to go to a shootout. No, just kidding. Uh, all right, so um, no shootout. We will enter now into our final round. Uh, remember, if you'd like to vote right now, you can do so. Just follow the instructions at the bottom of your screen. Go to Twitter, figure out whether it's the Americas or Europe. Final round, Sarah, take us to the end. <laughs> Well, this is getting exciting. It sounds like everything is left to play for on both sides. So let's get into our grand finale. Today's final question pits the Europeans and the North Americans against each other once more. 
We all know that regulation is integral to the financial service industry's development and indeed its evolution. But which approach is more effective? A European style top-down regulatory approach or a US style market-driven one? So we're gonna start with Jamie. Over to you for the European team's opening position. So regulation, it is the uh, rules that everyone in this industry has to play by. And I think when you uh, look at things like sports, rules are there to kind of stop it all disintegrating into absolute chaos. Um, but what regulation also does is it creates high walls around this kind of sacred garden that is financial services. Um, so when you look at the European model and what they've tried to do uh, with the likes of kind of open banking and regulatory sandbox initiatives, what they're, what they're doing is they're lowering these walls for uh, entrance into this market. And that has spurred on a wave of competition and a wave of innovation that I think uh, is pretty unprecedented when you look uh, around the world. So I'm going to talk uh, first about the uh, sandbox initiative from the, uh, from, from the FCA. Uh, Bud was involved in the first cohort of the FCA sandbox. We're also involved in the third cohort of the FCA sandbox. And really that's a way for people to safely trial new initiatives uh, with a closed group of consumers for a set period of time against a set hypothesis. That is a way for not only us as a startup to learn, but also the regulator to learn about our business and how that is going to affect the market. A crucial piece of of the puzzle that needs to happen, otherwise uh, that kind of initiative falls on its on its on its knees. And then secondly, open banking and, and PSD2 allow it, you're breaking down the walls uh, around banking data so that customers can take that data and use it and have it analyzed in any way that they choose. That's one of the key parts about uh, you know that's going to introduce new co uh, competition in this market. And that also touches on payments as well, breaking down the walls of large payments companies so that you know, a customer can initiate a bank-to-bank -bank transfer uh, from wherever they choose, pending them being regulated. I think this kind of innovative uh, play, playing field that the regulation and the regulatory environment of Europe has set out is absolutely the right way to go because it's the rules that everyone plays by. And without that, uh, you know, you get into some real sticky situations. Uh, looking at other markets where there should have been regulation, just look at the US, uh, air, <laughs> just look at the, the US um, aviation uh, department. Look at, the, look at the four big players there and the lack of regulation, uh, what that lead, led to. Hopefully we won't have any customers being dragged out of bank branches by their feet in any time in the EU. <laughs> Some fighting talk there to finish on. Thank you very much, Jamie. So Catherine, over to you for the US's opening position. I do hope that our voters don't confuse what I'm about to say with a vote for Team Europe. But it seems pretty hard to argue that the US market-based regulatory regime is as effective as the European-based model. Um, so I'm not here to argue on behalf of the Americans, but I am here to um, suggest that the reason that that model works is because it really involves a very strong focus on the customer experience and on customer rights, customer ownership of data. And that's very, very important. Um, I think the difference is in the US, um, regulators and policymakers and lawmakers believe that the customer is the business, is the financial institution, is the bank, whereas the European model assumes that the customer is actually the consumer. And that's a really important distinction. Um, I, I, I spend a lot of time in DC, and I spent some time um, talking with someone, um, a, a policymaker, about FCRA, the Fair Credit Reporting Act, which is really archaic and arcane and has been revised a couple of times, but doesn't take into, effect, into, into account any of the new data and tools and technology that could be brought to bear for the lending process and for making a credit evaluation. For example, social data that could be used to help provide more access to capital, more access to credit for the underserved and the underbanked and the new to the market. So um, I think that's the difference between a principles-based um, regulatory regime, which is what Simon mentioned earlier, and the market-driven model. So the market-driven model in the US also hasn't driven any um, advancements on the regulatory framework for non-bank financial institutions. So appropriate regulation is really important. Um, we make 
comes to small businesses. I don't transfer money. I don't um, take deposits. I don't make investments for my customers. So it's really important that we figure out how to regulate appropriately for exactly what a company is doing and not burden them with a bunch of cumbersome regulations that aren't even applicable. And I think that's what's been slowing us down. So again, I think it's really important to embrace the model that the Europeans have taken with PSD2 and GDPR, um, focusing on the customer experiencing, focus fo on the customer experience, focusing on their access to data, and realizing that they're really the ones who are driving the market. Thank you very much, Catherine, and to Jamie as well. So it looks like we have a vote of confidence for the European regulatory system, uh, which may make the rebuttal slightly easier. Um, before we get to that, I just want to remind the audience that time is running out to vote. So please head over to Twitter and make sure you do that. Uh, Simon, would you like to give a rebuttal? I, I feel like you have a relatively easy starting point there. So since we've already uh, agreed that um, the European um, system of regulation is preferable to an open market, I'll just I'll add a few things. I think regulation. Um, um, can not just regulate markets, but it can create new markets. The um, open banking initiative here um, was driven by PSD2, a piece of legislation that applies to all banks. But the Competition and Markets Authority here in the UK decided to really get ahead of that and um, make the largest nine banks sort of um, do all of the work up front. They made them basically create APIs or conform to an API standard. Um, before they were even required to. And that wasn't to sort of like suppress competition. It wasn't to, to limit the free market. It was to basically make all of the customers' data available to the customers. It was to sort of raise the amount of customer data that was available so that fintech companies like Bard and, and others that want to build things on top of that data could have the assurance that that, that data was going to be there, right? So the, the point of that regulation was not to, to control a free market. It was to create a new market. And the other thing I would say about especially London is uh, in the US you have all of the tech in San Francisco and all the regulators in, in DC and all of the money in, in New York. It's 1,400 meters from Silicon Roundabout, which is the spiritual center of tech in the UK, to the Bank of England. That's about 0 0.9 miles. Uh, so beat that. <laughs> Thank you very much, Simon. And so we are heading back to Jeff for the final rebuttal of today's event. So I think, um, you know, what happens in the regulatory world is, a, is an interesting conversation. But candidly, most of us in this room have absolutely zero impact on what the regulators do or don't do. So I think the more interesting question is how do you use both the regulatory regimes that are out there and how do you use sort of this free market approach to actually get people excited. And the truth is, neither actually get people excited. Um, for the average financial advisor, they don't even know who the OCC is um, or the SEC. And they just see that as sort of a, a, a way that, that gets in the way of them doing business. And also, if you try to sell these things as this big innovation play, most people don't care about that either. I mean, the people on this call, on this webcast, probably are innovation focused, and we're like, we need to innovate, we innovate. Nobody cares about that either. And I would just go back to um, really a theme that I think is, has sort of played out here through, through the whole conversation is going back to what the client wants, knowing what your competitive advantage is as an organization to drive that, and solve real problems. Right? I guess I'm going to bookend this by saying all of this is interesting unless it speeds a client experience drives a better investment outcome for a client, creates alpha. If you are not doing those things, you are failing. And by the way, sometimes you do those things, it has nothing to do with technology. It may have to do with business processes. It may have to do with better training of your employees. It may be communicating your goals and objectives more clearly. And I guess I would end by saying, let's not forget that those things still matter. Leadership still matters. Cooperation still matters. And for all the conversation about FinTech, I still believe that our success and failure rest on those fundamental capabilities. Thank you. Nice. Thank you very much, Jeff. And now over to Simon, the other Simon, for our final summary of the day. So I think it's interesting that we've got to remember the fundamentals. We've got to remember to serve customers. Uh, but what I think is interesting about the principles-based regulation approach that both of these gentlemen mentioned is that it does serve customers. It is in their interests. And it, I think it really matters that 
people who were underserved and that couldn't get bank accounts before can now get bank accounts because fintech companies are encouraged to do things. And I think uh, the principles-based regulation has allowed for that. And I think we all in this room and everybody listening can make a difference. I don't think it's as hopeless as we can't make a difference. We absolutely can. And we can make a difference, as these gentlemen said, by going into the sandboxes. And now the OCC and the CFTC and the USA have sandboxes. Go speak to your regulator people. They're not that scary. I think this is an exciting time for fintech innovation. Thank you very much, Simon. So now over to Jill for the final results. Uh, round nine winner is Europe, which means because of our tie, Europe is ahead five to three, making it mathematically impossible for the US to win at this point. That said, this has been a, an amazingly illuminating day for all of us. Um, I love talking about the overhyped and underwhelmed uh, areas like identity management systems and blockchain. Uh, I love the idea of how we can use our data and provide insights to enhance the customer journey. Uh, I like the idea that banks have to show that they love us. Please print t-shirts immediately. And also how we need to rethink not just our systems, but our approaches to many of these problems. Uh, I think we've all sort of agreed that blockchain's not quite there yet, but maybe there's something there, unless it is a bet against humanity. That would be a little scary. Where is the customer service being delivered? I think it's Euro Euro Europe, US, China, Africa, fintechs, established institutions, startups, maybe even those big tech companies. I do believe, as someone who comes from the financial services industry, that the, our ability to use technology to enhance customer relationships is really going to be the critical issue. Um, I like the, the, the sense of the collaboration between the established firms and fintechs really will rely on a diversity of talent, of diversity of thought, geographic diversity, um, and that your culture is not just words at the top, but filters through your entire organization. Uh, as we kind of look ahead, uh, that, that conversation around big tech and looking east versus west really opened my eyes in many ways. Regulation is always a, a little bit of a ginger topic for any of us. Uh, I, I, I've always been much more impressed by the rules-based versus the principles-based. Um, but specifically, the customer is clearly in the limelight here. And maybe customers, at least here in the US, are going to have to take charge a little bit more and demand more of our regulators. I know that you guys know this in, in here in this room, but right now we have a regulatory regime that is being dismantled. Uh, and I'll just put a plug into my friends over at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau who are being defunded right now at the expense of customers and consumers around the United States. So with that said, um, do my friends in Sunnyvale have a winner for me for round number 10? OK, gang, Europe has won round number 10. If you're keeping score, Europe, you just won six to three. Look at them doing some sort of wave, some odd kind of characterization there of a wave. Uh, before we go, uh, I, I do want to thank a bunch of people who made this possible. Uh, first of all, uh, the, the folks here at LinkedIn and at Capgemini and 11FS have put on an amazing event. Uh, Jennifer Grazel's team at LinkedIn, Jan, Chris, Caspian, amazing, Capgemini, Bill, the team with Shirag, Aaron, Ken, 11FS, Sam, Simon, Ollie. Um, I would be remiss if I did not shout out our technology team here in New York. Uh, we've got Dan leading the way, David, Sean, Paul, Tim, Tommy, David, Brian, our cameraman, Ed, Jeff, Ramon. And in Sunnyvale and in London, Ramiro, Gary, Joshua, Tersh. Whew, okay. To close out this day, I am pleased to introduce to you Bill Sullivan, head honcho is what I like to call him. He goes by head of financial services, market intelligence, senior director at Capgemini. Woo! 
Bill. Great. Thanks a lot, Jill, and, and thanks everyone for tuning in today. Um, we really set out to have a different conversation in a different format. I think we did a phenomenal job. Uh, Jill, Sarah, uh, absolute rock stars in managing this. Uh, we, we put a lot on you, and uh, you, you far over-delivered on what we ever thought could be possible. Uh, the debate captains on the US side uh, and the European side, you guys did a great job. And thank you for all the debate p participants. I know you took a big gamble on this format in terms of what we threw out there and what we were planning on doing. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I think it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, Please go back and watch the conversation. I think there's a lot of relevant things happening. We covered a lot of great themes. Um, you can go to the www.fintechworldreport.com, download the report that we just launched. We covered all of the themes that we discussed in the, in the debate today. We've got some great Agents of Change videos that we've done, which also have some senior leaders from fintechs, from incumbents, that also are covering these themes. So I think we're in an uh, and, and Jennifer, certainly, thanks for the partnership. Uh, it's been a phenomenal time. It's our second year. I think we able to, you know, jumped up the bar this year, and it was a lot of fun. So thanks, everyone, for joining, uh, and, and have a great day. Thank All right. you all.